Let's start over here with. It's a bit of a. Well, I'll be a little controversial. Because there's. Well, let's say what it is first. It's the thalamus. And this sorts out information. By sorts out information in a real general sense, it finds out what's important, groups, and prioritizes. information coming into the body or let's say coming into the brain if you're driving your car the little white the little yellow line or white line right down the middle is what's important <clears throat> but if all of a sudden you see motion off to the side that could be a deer and so that becomes important because you don't want to hit that deer and also uh, when you're in a crowded room and maybe there's a lot of noise and somebody yells out your name, you can usually hear your name because the thalamus finds that to be important. Uh, uh, before I go on, another example of what that's doing is it's grouping information. You'll find, if you've ever seen the McGurk effect, the McGurk effect is an audio, audio illusion basically where the mouth has been changed so you can't hear what's going on. So the mouth is not in sync with what you're hearing. And it shows us that you actually have to line up what you see with your eyes and what you hear as well. And it's thought that the thalamus does that because that's two different pieces of sensory information coming in and they have to be paired up so that you can actually watch somebody's lips move and hear what they're saying. And somebody's got to line up that information and it's thought to be the thalamus. There's a lesion with thalamus. And this is just part opinion part based on seeing somebody with autism, working with someone with autism. And my wife teaches people with autism, so I see autistic students a lot. And in general, I always see sensory deficits. Like the person that I particularly worked with, he didn't seem to like to go downstairs because he didn't seem to be able to see the line. He didn't seem to be able to pick out what sensory information was important. Like, he doesn't look you in the eyes. He can't find lines when he's going downstairs. He doesn't seem to be able to sort out information and just basically ignore things and so it leads to a frustrating lifestyle at times because he just can't shut things down. He gets really angry if there's unpredictable noises. Whereas the rest of us could probably just ignore those things, he could not. And so it suggested to me that there's a lot of opinions on thalamus, but it's on autism, but it suggests to me that it might be something with a thalamus as well. Because this particular gentleman I worked with, he couldn't <clears throat> pick out important things. Shadows would bother him. He didn't make eye contact, which most of us would see as important. He just seemed to be overwhelmed by stimulation, by sensations. And that's true if you read something called by uh, someone called Temple Grandin. She would actually suggest that they would compress themselves so that they could actually be in control of this excess sensory information. And this person that I w worked with took a lot of baths, and I thought that that was probably because that helps him control the amount of sensation that's coming into his body. <clears throat> so right here is the pineal gland. Is involved in sleep wake cycles. This area right here. Is the choroid plexus. There's several places where there's choroid plexus. It's draped down from the ventricles. There's some down here as well. But this makes CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, this guy here is called the corpus callosum. Kind of picked a bad color there, didn't I? It's right next to the other one. This is the corpus callosum, and this 
shares information, allows both sides of the hemispheres to share information. So connects right and left hemispheres. And there's kind of a classic lesion there. It's called split brain. They used to, if there was somebody that had epilepsy and they'd start a seizure on the left side of the brain, that seizure would spread over to the right side of the brain. So one of the strategies early on was to cut the corpus callosum. So at least then, the seizure would stop on one side of the hemispheres. On one side of the brain, it wouldn't spread to the other side. And then it would at least limit that, the seizure. But it was found that that caused something called sp split brain, where people could identify something if it was shown in the right eye, as I believe how it went, because that information in the right eye would go to the left brain, and the left brain is responsible for language. But then if they'd show the same thing to the right brain, so they'd show it to the left eye, so it went to the right brain, then the person could tell what it did. Well, that's a writing utensil, but they couldn't name it. So I'm being a little bit brief here, but what I mean is it separated the part of the brain that knew what something was called from the part of the brain that knew what you did with it. <clears throat> Getting a little crowded. This right here. It's called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is responsible for things like blood pressure. Not completely responsible, but it has a hand in these processes. Breathing, body temp, hunger, hormone cycles. As long as we're talking about hormone cycles. This great guy right here this is the pituitary, major player in the endocrine system. It has two parts, posterior and anterior. Posterior puts out two hormones, anterior puts out five hormones. We'll talk about that in the endocrine system. I think that's it for this. We're going to flip this sheet over and do it again.